Hello and welcome to the second part of this fundamentals course in XPS for Beginners. Hopefully you found the first part useful and you've gone through some of the examples and questions uh, on the Guru page and you're feeling a bit more confident about everything we've talked about so far and uh, and you're ready to move on to, to the second part. So in this session we're going to be going over some of the things which govern how binding energies shift and how we can use this to look at some of the oxidation state and chemical information of our sample uh, and get an understanding of some of the ways in which XPS is used. And we're also going to cover OJ peaks. So I mentioned these in the first video and we're just going to take a little bit of a look at what they are, how they arise and how we can use them for additional information. So let's, uh, let's get straight in. So why do peaks move? So we saw in the first video that um, the binding energy of different orbitals is different. So when we have, for example, a gold 4F versus a gold 4D, the uh, the binding energy of these two is, is very different in the spectra. But also if we look more closely at individual peaks, so for example, a gold 4F, we can see changes, so s subtle slight changes to these binding energies depending on the chemical nature of the emitting atom. And then obviously we can use these and model our data to get a bit more information about the chemical nature of our surfaces. So the first and most obvious way in which uh, an atom may change is by changing the oxidation state. So if you're going from, for example, a zero valent metallic form to an ionized form or a complexation where you've got an anion and a ligand system, um, you're going to start getting charge changes and you're going to get a positive charge on your, your atom, which, which was metallic first. So since you've removed electron density from this system, your nucleus is now going to exert uh, a greater pull on the remaining electrons in the system, and this is going to increase the binding energy. So for example, if you think about us trying to photoionize um, silver metal versus silver plus, then the, the pull on those uh, electrons in the silver 3D orbital, for example, is going to be much greater on the silver plus than in the silver metal. So we're going to have an increased binding energy there. So here's a good example. So tungsten's a really nice example because we see a couple of oxidation states. We've got a couple of um, compounds that we can look at and we see some nice clear and obvious shifts in our data. So the first thing we can look at here is when we look at our oxidation state on our plot. Um, we've got um, tungsten metal, tungsten 4 plus and tungsten 6 plus we look at our binding energy changes, uh, you can see straight away when we increase our oxidation state, the binding energy increases, so we can see a clear and obvious difference in our peaks there. But not only do oxidation state changes affect the binding energy, we've also got the effect from the neighbouring atoms. So for example, if we change the electronegativity of our system, we're also going to be changing things like your charge dipoles, how much charge is localised on the the central metal atom versus the ligand, all of these things are going to affect, again, the binding energy of the remaining electrons in this system. So if we look at, for example, our tungsten 6 plus, we've got a couple of uh, compounds here. We have uh, WO3, we've got uh, WBR6, WCL6 and WF6. And uh, if you look at this, as we sort of increase the electronegativity here up to uh, WF6, we can see that we are removing more electron density from our tungsten and this is in turn increasing the binding energy. Uh, so it's a really nice example because you can just sort of see that not just oxidation state but chemical changes can affect the binding energy as well and we can use this to get some real chemical insights into our, uh, into our data and our samples. So that's how chemical shifts arise. Um, one other thing which can be quite useful for looking at uh, what chemical states are there, what structures are there in your sample is OJ peaks. Now these are generally quite obvious because they've got a broad and extended structure as opposed to the nice sharp peaks that we've looked at so far. So for example here we've got this oxygen 1s in the middle. We can see a single very nice sharp peak. If we look out to this oxygen OJ, then it's a bit broader. We've got a couple of extra features in there as well. Um, so one way that you can identify them is, is by that. But another way 
that you can identify OGs is that they change binding energy when you change the excitation energy. Now, of course, we're not actually changing the binding energy of anything here. What's actually going on is uh, the OGs have a fixed kinetic energy. So if you remember back to our photoelectric effect, if we change the incoming energy of our radiation, we're going to change the resultant kinetic energy of our released photoelectrons. Now, this is different for Auger peaks. They have a fixed kinetic energy regardless of what excitation energy you use. As long as it's enough to uh, begin the process, we will see these Auger peaks. Uh, and that's because they are an intrinsic process of the atom. So here we've got a bit of an example of some ele electronic orbitals, 2s, 2p and 3d. One of the things that can happen when you remove a photoelectron via photoemission. So for here, for example, we've, we've excited a 2p electron and we're, we're left with a core hole. Um, and our atom would kind of like to be in a lower energy state. So what it can do is it can relax one of the electrons in a higher orbital so for in this case um, it's the th one of the electrons in the 3d orbital will relax to the 2p to fill that core hole and as it relaxes from a higher orbital to a lower orbital it has to release some energy because it's going to a lower energy state and the energy that it releases comes out in the form of an x-ray and as we've already seen from the first um, session here when you have an x-ray in an atom you were going to produce another photoelectron. So the x-rays from this relaxation process will then kick out another electron as a photoelectron. Now because the energy different, the energy of um, the relaxation process is fixed, it doesn't matter whether you use a 1000 EV excitation source or a 2000 EV excitation source, this energy difference during the relaxation process is always going to be fixed which means we're always going to get a fixed kinetic energy as well from our released photoelectron uh, and this is why we see them if we go back to our um, our profile here we can see when we've we've changed our x-axis to kinetic energy our OJ peaks now overlap whereas our our core lines peaks have moved because we've changed our incoming um, excitation energy whereas if we go back again to our binding energy this is where we see the OJ peak move and our core levels are the same. So that is how the OJ process works and it can often reveal a, a bit more about our sample that is sometimes not possible through traditional core line XPS. So one of the first ways in which we can use an uh, OJ peaks is to look at something called the OJ parameter. Now uh, this is defined as the kinetic energy of the OJ minus the kinetic energy of the core. So for example in our oxygen example here we've got an oxygen OJ and an oxygen 1s peak so we will take the difference of our OJ and our core spectra and that will give us our OJ parameter. This was later adapted to something called the modified OJ parameter. So this is the kind of standard that's used now. And instead of looking at the, the kinetic energies of the two, so the OJ and the core peaks, what we're actually looking at now is the OJ and the binding energy of the, the core peak. Now what this means is that this modified OJ parameter is independent of the excitation energy because we're taking the kinetic energy of the OJ which is fixed and then the binding energy of the core which is fixed uh, and this gives us um, an OJ parameter that we can then use a bit more universally uh, and one of the really useful things about um, the OJ parameter is that this is independent of any kind of uh, energy calibration which is something we're going to touch on a bit later in the course um, but it gives us a nice fixed value that we can use to, to probe oxidation states and chemical environments. So one of the classic examples of where OJ peaks and OJ parameters are uh, incredibly useful is copper. So if we look at our plot on the left here, we've got a couple of um, copper 2p regions from core line XPS. So you can see straight away the, the red spectrum in the middle where we've got uh, copper 2. Now this is quite obvious we've got 
quite a big difference between this and the other two spectra here we've got these extra peaks but if we look at our copper metal versus our copper one plus these are very similar the binding energy position is very similar the peaks are looking very similar so it's quite difficult to actually determine whether you've got copper metal or copper one However, if we look at our OJ peaks, uh, we can see here that there is actually quite a large difference in terms of the position here. Uh, so if you look at this and if you look at your OJ parameter, it gives you a much more reliable way to distinguish between the different copper types that you might have in your sample. So a bit of a summary. Um, we've looked at some of the ways in which binding energies can be affected, uh, such as oxidation state, chemical state. Electronegativity and dipoles uh, play a key role in these uh, energy shifts that we see and that we can then use this to go on and model later on when we come to process spectrum. Uh, and also we've had a look at OJ peaks, we've looked at how they arise and how uh, they can play a role in terms of both quantitative and qualitative assessment of chemical environments that we have in our sample. Uh, there will be a link, if you follow this by the, uh, the Guru page rather than the YouTube page, uh, we'll have some links to some of our articles which go into a bit more detail about the OJ processes and some of the other ways in which we can use these. This is just a bit of an introduction. Uh, if you're following on YouTube, then we'll have a link to the Guru page in the description below. So the next course uh, we've got coming up is a, the third part of our fundamentals course in which we're going to be looking at some uh, double peaks. So you've seen some of the spectra that we've looked at so far. You've probably noticed some of them look like doublets and some of them siglets. So we're going to discuss how these arise uh, and touch on a term called spin orbit coupling. So we'll see you there.